All right, this is Stacy Hughes. Hello, all. This is Stacy Hughes from Nebraska. I have heard somewhere that large stars are going to stop being born before other stars. If that is true, how much sooner than the last stars dying out mm -hmm. will the last supernova be? And what types of stars will be born after the last supernova? And will we still be here <laughs> When that happens, let me take that last part for you. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't look like it. <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> uh, given the rate at which humans have been developing technologies capable of destroying all of us, mm. I'm not sure. I'd say we have maybe a 50-50 chance. Okay. Okay. But if we make it through the next century or two, maybe we'll get smart enough or maybe we'll, we'll disperse away from the earth and be able to hang in there. Let me answer your question about the most massive stars. When we look out in the Milky Way galaxy, mm -hmm. we see large clouds of gas and dust, okay. some, including things we call giant molecular clouds. And these are the objects that give birth to new stars. Mm -hmm. And we see the same kinds of objects in nearby galaxies, and we can image them in great detail with the Hubble Space Telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope. And we see clusters of thousands of stars being born now throughout the Milky Way, throughout nearby galaxies. And there are almost always some really, really luminous, very, very massive stars in these youngest clusters, mm. up to about a hundred times the mass of the sun. Okay. Will this eventually stop? Well, we see galaxies where this has stopped because when galaxies crash into each other and merge, most of the gas, the hydrogen gas, the stuff out of which stars is born, much of it is liberated. Right. It's blown out of those galaxies. We're, okay. We're left behind with an elliptical galaxy that doesn't make many stars anymore. And so at some point it's possible, in fact, likely that every galaxy in the universe that has hydrogen in it will have lost all or most of that hydrogen. And when that happens, star formation is going to ramp down and eventually stop mm -hmm. billions of years into the future, but not right now. Will we be around billions of years in the future? <laughs> oh, no yeah, idea. Come on. <laughs> Cannot yeah. tell you. Yeah, I can. I can tell you. I can tell <laughs> you, you right you know, now. You know, you, uh, you yeah. got the answer now. I got the answer right now, okay. Stacy. That's a great question though. And these gas clouds that you see, are, are these the same as stellar nurseries? Is that what we... No, that's, that that's exactly yeah. right. Oh, yeah. okay. The, okay. the nearest prominent one, you can see it with the naked eye, is the Orion Nebula. Right. Underneath the three stars in the belt is this lovely go glowing cloud. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, they're above the belt. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one... So like us to hit below the belt. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one O star, one of those massive stars that's doing all the ionization, all the excitation. It is the guy that is responsible mostly for the central part of the Orion Nebula looking like it is. If it oh. weren't there, it'd be a much less interesting thing to look at. Wow. That is super cool, man. All right. This is uh, Christopher Peffers. And Christopher says, hello, Dr. Shara, Dr. Tyson, Lord Nice, Chris Peffers here from Charleston, Indiana. Dr. Shara, you spent decades studying exploding stars and binary systems, mm -hmm. some of the most extreme objects in the universe. For people who might think space is just empty and still, can you walk us through what happens in a closed binary system mm -hmm. where one of the stars steals matter from another, eventually causing a supernova or a nova or a or even a supernova. Mm -hmm. What does that cosmic drama look like? And should everyday people even care about these distant events? Do they help us understand our own sun? Or even where the elements going? that make up life on <laughs> Earth come from? <laughs> Thank you for your work, sir. <laughs> there it is. Well, it, first of all, it's my pleasure. Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, pat on the back, sort of the verbal pat on the back. Right. Uh, I do it, the reason I've, I've spent decades doing this is because I love it. Uh, astronomy in some sense is my hobby. Uh, the fact that someone's willing to pay me to do it and to teach That's the, the public adage. about it. Uh, take it your is, hobby, make it a career it's, and you'll never, what is it? The, right. The, uh, well, yes. Yeah, so you'll, you'll never be something. You'll, you know, you'll never work a day you'll in your life. You'll never work a day in your life. Yeah, That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. been a joy. And in some sense, I haven't worked a day in my life because it's always been fun. It's always been mm -hmm. great. That's and pretty cool. And I get to work with lots of bright young people doing their 
masters and PhDs and work with them all the time. Very so it's cool. a glorious way to spend one's life. Okay, let's zoom in on one of these systems, one of these binary systems. And I'm going to pick a particular system okay. that you're going to be able to see with your naked eye Ooh. next year or the year after. Okay. Okay. All right. Relatively short period of time. <laughs> I bet he's talking about T-Core on Butter Alice. And oh. Neil has just okay, thrown a bullseye. Yeah, don't tell anybody. Okay. But I think, exactly Stay right. quiet. And, and when he says it, just then act, we'll say, act surprised. Act surprised. Act surprise. Okay. okay. Yeah, so. Uh, what so, is it? So, <laughs> <laughs> so there is a star called T. Corona Borealis. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Woo, surprise. Uh -huh. uh, that is going to get brighter than the North Star, brighter than Polaris. Wow. Uh, either tonight or tomorrow night or sometime in the next year or two. Okay, just, I have to, I have to jump in here. Okay. Um, so. I, I'm, I don't want to cast shade on how bright it's going to get, but Polaris ain't that bright. Okay. okay? Our North Star. <laughs> Which I've heard you say this. Even and nine out of 10 people, you say, what's the brightest North Star? They'll say, say North, the Star. North Star. It is not in the top 10. It's right. not in the top 20. Right. It's not in the top 30. Yes. It's not even in the top 40. Yes. Okay. So I just put that out there right now. And uh, what the core bore, what is that reference? Corona Borealis, mm -hmm. Latin for a Northern crown. And it is a constellation, a little grouping of stars that looks like a semicircle, a crown. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, that's a tiara would be a that. But. <laughs> that's a better term. It would be, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Much better name. So is there a, a, a crown in the Southern Hemisphere There too? is, Corona Australis. Okay, good. So that's why yes. you specify the Borealis. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. So pick it, pick it up from there. <laughs> we saw this star last erupt about 79 years ago. And then 80 years before that, we saw it erupt as a nova, and each time it became about second magnitude. And one of my colleagues, Brad Schaefer, has made a pretty good case for it having erupted 80 years before, before that. that. And then he even points out some possible evidence for an eruption in the 1200s. Cool. So this is a star. <laughs> this is a recurrent nova. Wait, nobody was looking up in the 1200s. They, uh, they were just trying to not... Whatever. Not starve Get to eaten death. eaten by or, dragons or, or right. not starve to death. Or die of the bubonic plague. No, no, no. There were people who actually did notice mm -hmm. changing stars, things that were wild. And of course there were no electric lights in those yeah, days. Yeah, a lot more all, stars to look at. Uh, yeah. There were. Actually, sorry, it was the 14th century, which was the only century where the population of the world was lower at the end than it was at the beginning. Mm. From the bubonic plague yeah, and all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Black death will do it every time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I can't stand it. They called it the black death. But, yeah. <laughs> of course, the most deadly of deaths <laughs> has to be the black death. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'm being silly. Go ahead. <laughs> no worries. So this star, uh, this massive white dwarf, is cannibalizing. Its companion, which right. is a, in this case, a red giant star. An authentic red giant. This is an authentic red giant. Can you see both stars when you look at them? Uh, or are you, they too far away? You can see neither. It is roughly 13th magnitude in quiescence. So if you look uh, with a terrific pair of binoculars, you still can't see it. Mm. You need at least, if you want to see it with your naked eye or with your eye, you need at least, say, an eight or a 10 inch telescope to be able so to see it really at all. a really good backyard telescope, backyard telescope, would, telescope. would catch this. We'll see it when it's in quiescence. Okay. And it's going to jump uh, in brightness um, approximately 100,000 fold uh, to reach roughly the brightness, a little bit brighter probably than Polaris for mm -hmm. a few hours. Uh, and then it'll fade away. And oh, then wow. on a time scale of um, a week or two, you won't see it again. Uh, and you won't see it again for another 80 years. So when I was in the Pacific Northwest, I took a photo of your star. And I don't know if I got to show it to you. Uh, did I? Did I ever show it to you? I think you might Because, you know, there was a chance it could have blown up while I was looking at it. Exactly. And then I'd be the first. To have seen right. it. I, I, or at I, least have recorded it. I'd have been the first out of the box on that one. Yep. Everyone wants to be the one to, to see, see it. it starting on its rise. Of course. And so people have little charts. Right. And okay, there's T. Corona Borealis. So somebody's watching this thing every night. Of course. Someone is watching it basically every 24 minute, 24-7. Oh, because half the world is dark at any given time. And, and, and we got people everywhere. Of course you do. <laughs> there are <laughs> tens of thousands of so-called amateur astronomers who are every bit as professional as mm -hmm. professional astronomers. Right. In that community, Go ahead. it is a badge of honor 
to say, mm -hmm. I am an amateur astronomer. If you say that, you can ask them any question about the night sky and they'll have an answer. They know. Even some of my colleagues wouldn't know because we they know the night sky. They're out there every night, mm. as I was when I was, you know, had my backyard telescope, except right. my rooftop. I, there's no backyard in the Bronx. Right. <laughs> I was hauled to the roof. So the thing for me that is most exciting about T. Corona Borealis is that as a recurrent nova, it was predicted, and, and there were only 10 recurrent novae known in the whole Milky Way okay. uh, about a decade ago. It was predicted that, boom, you blow off a shell of matter, then 80 years later, boom, you blow off another shell, another, another, another. The stuff doesn't all come off at the same speed. Some of it comes off at high speed, some at a lower speed. So what that means is when the next shell goes off. Someone's going to overcome, it's going to, the fast stuff is going to overtake the, the slow, slow stuff. stuff. Bingo. So you're going to have shells colliding with each when other. Shells, shells collide. Shells colliding, Jerry. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And, and that's so amazing. it's going to be a traffic pile up. Right. Whoa. It's like, you know, one car running into another. And if that's right. That hasn't just been happening for 80 or 160 or 240 or 320 years. It's been going on for thousands or tens of thousands of years, which means you've got hundreds or thousands of shells piled up on top of each other. Mm. That means you should have a super shell, right. a super remnant surrounding T. Corona Borealis. Where it's all, where it, the fastest stuff is plowed onto itself, That's right? A, a bulldozed its way through. But that's not all. Wait, wait, there's more because as that shell builds up in mass, it's also acting like a snowplow, plowing up all the stuff in the interstellar medium in front of it. The stuff that's there anyway as bystanders. Is going to get mowed over and is going to be incorporated into that and super so shell. shell. So there should be a super duper shell nah. around it. And we've just found it. Oh! Yay! He you buried heard, the lead. What? You heard it here. What? So we've been using a gorgeous new, not expensive telescope. Oh. The kind of telescope that so-called amateurs use, refracting telescopes. Six of them bolted together in parallel. And we stared at T. Corona Borealis for about a hundred hours. They're not in darkness for a hundred hours. I just want to make that clear. No. Oh, right. okay. Right. Right. Yeah. They get the, the dark stuff tonight. Right. They close the hatch and, and then tomorrow night. Pick it up again. We're back at it. Okay. Back at it. Okay. Right. Go. And so we actually have thousands of images taken over more than a hundred nights of T. Corona Borealis. And we add up all those images and we took pictures through filters that only transmit the light from hydrogen only transmits Sweet. the light that comes from nitrogen ions, sulfur ions, and so on. And we found a super shell surrounding T. Corona Borealis that's about three times the diameter of the full moon. That's fabulous. So it is a degree and a half on the sky. And you might then think, well, when T. Corona Borealis goes off, it's going to be like a flash bulb going off in the room, in a room full of little mirrors. Right. It's going to be like Christmas lights going off as this flash of light right. propagates outwards. Through. Echoes off uh, the, the material. The super shell. One would hope that that would be true. That's amazing. It's probably not. Oh, no. So the downer is we published in a paper that just came out a couple of months ago saying, there's not going to be fluorescence. Okay. So the atoms themselves are not going to light up because they're too far apart and there aren't enough of them. It's not going to be bright enough to detect. Now, maybe, just maybe, if there was dust, little grains of silicon and carbon and other what we call refractory elements, high temperature stuff, little grains that were tossed out in the last Nova eruption, the one 80 years ago, those might reflect enough light for us to see as a light echo. And you know that a day or two or three after this goes off, the Hubble Space Telescope is going to get pointed at at the James yeah, Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, we're very telescope. good about that. Yeah. Something happens, everybody... Comes and, together. Comes, we, we are the most Shares come together. Information. We are the most come together. We're always about a collabo. Always, especially since not every telescope We'll observe it in the same way. Yeah. So you get a different kinds of data coming together. I always say okay, the only people to collaborate more than rappers 
Our astrophysicist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Mike, on my iPhone, I controlled a digital telescope when I was in the Pacific Northwest. Didn't even leave the comforts of the living room when <laughs> I did this. See, he's 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 old school. He's mm -hmm. like, "What? You didn't like and ascend the mountain? You, <laughs> you did not uh, suffer for that image? <laughs> I've been up in the prime focus <laughs> cage of telescopes for <laughs> nights at a time. It. Hour, but right. his, uh, tell me about it on your rocking chair, right? Exactly. Right, 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 right. Exactly. So, this image, I, I found it but it was behind a, tr a very modeled tree. Mm. And so uh, the digital telescope tracks it. And, but so the tree ends up blurred as it's tracking the, the actual object. So it looks, it's a very undistinguished dot on my, on my picture. Had yeah. you caught it near its maximum, you would basically have saturated the image. Yeah. All of the image would be just one bright point of light. Mm -hmm. Wow. But there's no saturation anymore because this knows what it's doing. Mm. It takes 10 second images yes. and then stacks them. <laughs> right. Yeah, gotcha. in the old days, right. you, you, you right. expose you it. Overexposed. You oh, it get overexposed. Actually, yeah. Right, yeah. Right, right. Now you don't have that no, problem. We got because this. You're getting all separate images. It's separate, and then yeah, you stack right. them and right. add them, and you get yeah. it. Thank you.